The following podcast is a Jill Divine Media production. Christianity has become known for judgy people, strange words, ancient stories, confusing rules, and a members-only mindset. This is why I stayed away from the church for so long, but it's not supposed to be that way. I'm Jill Devine, a former radio personality with three tattoos, a love for a good tequila, and who's never read the entire Bible. Yet, here I am hosting a podcast about faith. The Normal Goes a Long Way podcast is your home for real conversations with real people using real language about how faith and real life intersect. Welcome to the conversation. Welcome to Normal Goes a Long Way. This is Laura Fleetwood, and I am here today with Dr. Trisha Wellstead. Welcome, Trisha. Thanks. I'm glad to be here with you. So Trisha and I met through Portland Seminary, where I'm currently in a doctoral program of leadership. And Trisha, you are my project faculty. So um, it's been really fun getting to know you and have your insight um, to my studies. And I'm really thrilled that you're here today to share a little bit about your story and what um, God is is doing through you these days. So why don't you take our listeners um, through the basics of who you are and what we are going to talk about today regarding finding your purpose in life. Yeah, so I um, I hail from the West Coast. I'm from Oregon, and I uh, my faith journey started when I was a kid with my parents wanting to have a good uh, help. They wanted support and, and being able to raise us. And I'm the oldest of three. So probably it was me that was pushing all their boundaries as I'm known to do. And I, um, I really felt found like the sense of purpose and hopefulness in my life and around middle school. And that journey kind of propelled me into like, while at a church, the the one that my parents had started going to, um, to like seeking and being really curious as to who God was and, um, what, what it meant for my, my life to be, um, a disciple of Jesus. And so then I, I started following my youth pastors around a bit more and wanting to know, um, a lot more about their life and and just got really involved and and mostly out of some painful seasons in my own personal life and middle school and such. And I found a lot of hope in that space and also was always kind of a class clown slash uh, uh, sometimes a leader, sometimes an agitator, I guess. And so I uh, ended up doing a lot of leading. And I I mentioned all of this because it started when I was really young and I was mentored by this youth pastor couple who um, really invested in me, mentored me. And then I became an intern and then I became the interim youth pastor. And then I became the youth pastor. Like it was just this journey Mm -hmm. with them. And, uh, and it mattered to me, the investment that they made in my life when I was a kid and that they valued me as somebody who could be a leader and wasn't just an agitator or the class clown or just a kid. Like my voice really mattered. I love that. They saw something in you that they kind of pulled out. It sounds like. Yeah. And I, I mean, I had a lot of things I was involved in, in school with sports and um, different other extracurriculars. And so I could have just been the public school kid that was really involved in cheerleading and basketball and doing all the other stuff. But uh, the love that they showed me revealed the love of God to me. And then it made me want to be more invested into a community of faith. And then the way that they mentored me impacted my life so much that I thought this is the way that I want to do this with other people over time. So I felt this sense of calling in high school to be a youth pastor. I didn't really know what that meant. No one in my family was in ministry ever. Um, I was the first one to even graduate college. And so, um, so yeah, so it was this kind of new journey that no one in my family was leading me on. It was just kind of this faith thing with these people and who uh, my parents had taken me to this church. And so, and my parents kept going. I mean, they found faith at the same time I did really. And so... Yeah. So then that, I mean, that's like a long time ago now, but 
through that, there's been a lot of different iterations of what I've done in the way of doing youth ministry and church planting and discipleship ministry and uh, leadership development. All of those iterations look a lot like me either mentoring or coaching people a, a bit alongside in, in some small group and some large group or, or really leading the leaders of the small group kinds of things, uh, capacity and helping people to really get clear on who are they? Who did God make them to be? What's the unique stuff that's in them that um, that's from God, from their personality to, uh, to their experiences, to their family, to their giftings, all the things that all the things that make them them that God has given them as, as really as gifts to the world. So all of that kind of goes into some of the other stuff that I, that I think about with vocational work and leadership and purpose, all of it. So here's the question that I've been ruminating on and and maybe because I have a high school senior daughter and a sophomore and they're constantly thinking about where they're going to go to school and what career they want. And there's that age old question, you know, what is my calling? Like, what is my purpose in life? And what I love about what you do at the Leadership Center is you really take people through a process that helps them answer that question. So tell us, like, what? how did that come to be that you help people discover their calling? And what does that journey look like when you work with them? Yeah. So I always thought, I'm like, I'm just going to work with people. So I was like, I, when I entered college as a high school student in my freshman year of college, I was like, well, I'll either be a youth pastor or a counselor or a teacher. I just like people. And so those were kind of my options. And I, and I quickly ruled out two of them, uh, partially one of them, the education one was simply because there was a lot of tests I had to take and I was not into it. (laughs) Um, but here I am, I work at a university, so full circle. Um, anyway, I, what I, have have seen is that we tend to think whether young or old, it really doesn't matter. But especially I think when we're younger, that we have one thing that we're supposed to do and we have to find, figure it out. Kind of like how people think, well, I have a soulmate out there and I have to find them. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, okay, what am I going to do with this one precious life that I have? I don't want to waste my time, but I also don't want to get it wrong. Um, And, and I like to disprove that a little bit. And I've taught at the undergraduate level quite a bit now with freshmen in particular, usually on this vocation topic, because so many people feel this sense of calling, just like I did. of like, I think I'm called to be a youth pastor. I'm called to do this thing. And they feel this kind of like on high thing from God, if they're Christians, um, that they need to do this one path. And it usually looks like a job. And I try to break it down for them a little bit, but like gently, because there, there's also the, the potential that they may not get that job or mm-hmm. they may not be great at that. that. That might just be something that they've idealized because they've seen someone else in their life. And so then they're trying to conform to that other human that they valued. And so what I what I do is the process that I go through. And I, I've learned this a bit from a good friend and mentor, Deborah Lloyd, who wrote uh, your vocational credo. And it's just a method. There are many methods, but she has one. And I really like it because it takes into account people's stories and their history and also their future. And so um, what it does is you essentially you go back through people's lives and you you invite them to tell some themes from their life, themes of um, a first instance of pain that they remember. Um, Also a, um, a story. I I try to, to hone in with people or focus in on uh, their favorite childhood book that they loved or read was either read to them or they read often or a type of genre, even sometimes it's a movie for people, but a lot of times it's a book. And so then we pull out themes 
from that. We pull out emotions from the the first wounding that they had. And then we talk about how how do you feel like in your guts, if you could heal the world in any way, what would you do? Or who would you be? What would happen if money was not an object, time was not an object? What would you do? And so with all of that, it helps them to start to think bigger and deeper, like bigger about their life, deeper. It helps them to dream. And it also helps them to see the connections between their past, present, and future and how that innocent story even drops in values. And, and it's not everything those, I mean, it's not a magic little triangle, but it does help to communicate in ways that gets them out of what they typically think. And then from there, we look at like this credo statement. So that's the, your vocational credo on God put me on earth to do these things from these values in this way that I see that I want to heal the world for this group of people. And we talk about demographics in different ways. Like maybe that's people who get marginalized, or maybe that's people who um, are in a particular age range, or maybe that's just people who feel defeated or rejected. Um, or maybe it's people who haven't had this, op- this particular opportunity. So all of that kind of stuff. And then for the purpose of, or so that this bigger thing would happen. And it's almost always tied to relationships, uh, Mm. these credo statements, uh, because in the end, that's what we have. It's not just about work, even if it's a relationship to the earth, to creation in some way, uh, humans affect humans. It's, it's really an impacting thing. And so there's a lot of that. And usually, not usually, I, I have not seen this not be true. So I'll say it that way with the double negative, um, the way we want to heal the world comes through our life. It can't not. And so then it also comes through the, a bit of redemption from our own pain in our story. It may not be totally direct, but sometimes it is, especially with a lot of deep wounding. Um, there's this, this experience I had, I want no one else in their whole life to have to have this, or I want to help them recover as I've recovered. And so then there's those types of themes that can be really strong, but then I, this is kind of, I went the long way around to answer your question, but what that does is it creates this baseline to where then you go, okay, well, what could you do with that? You don't have to be a social worker with this. You don't have to be a pastor with this. You could be, you could be a pastor. You're welcome to be a social worker. You're welcome to be a teacher. It, what it does is it breaks open the possibilities because sometimes we think we have this this thing we have to do for our whole life. Like maybe God told us this thing. We really feel clearly that we've heard from the Holy spirit, but that might be just seasonal. And so Mm -hmm. let's make sure that we have something that anchors us when that season's over. So we know that we're not suddenly in a crisis, a midlife crisis potentially. Um, So it can anchor us and evolve and grow throughout our whole life because we're still compiling experiences of, of like these lived experiences throughout our life, of course. I wonder if there is um, an example that you can share with us of how somebody has come to you um, with this question of, you know, what am I called to do in my life? And they've gone through this process. And then what, like, what results do you see after people really think about the circumstances God has brought them through and what skills and gifts they have and how they want to heal the world. Um, help paint us a picture of the outcome that people then are able to, to incorporate into their life. Yeah. I'm thinking of so many, uh, but I'll think I'll just hold one. Uh, so a lot of times people come to me to have this conversation, not always, but a lot of times in frustration or in the sense of they know that what what's happening for them right now isn't working or won't work in the future. So they're looking toward a transition. Sometimes that they're in a doctoral program. <laughs> Sometimes they are in a career where they feel stuck. I had someone call me yesterday that was like, uh, I've, I don't know what to do. Like this, I'm, I'm feeling really stuck. And about a year ago, there was somebody that called me or, or reached out and we set up a conversation and then I started coaching them through this to get clear on their sense of calling. 
because they've been in a job for, gosh, almost 20 years. And they loved it when they started and they felt a lot of life in it. And at this point, they feel really, really burnt out or they had, and they just didn't know what to do. And, and I thought, okay, let's talk. So we, we talked through it. We, we talked through their credo and what they realized is that they were really risk averse because they've been so in the position that they were in to where it was like, well, I I need to hold on to this because it will affect my family so much if I make any changes, but yet they were dying inside. Like our part of our conversation was um, you're, you're half dead. And what are you going to do about that? Because the way you're living affects your kids and you have teenagers who are watching you, who are experiencing your half-life that you're living here. And, and that was just an observation, but this whole conversation, we realized their passion areas, they weren't feeling like they could, they were so responsible that they couldn't actually live into them well. And by the end of our conversations, the end of our coaching time and solidifying their credo, they had made some really hard decisions that they wouldn't have made without somebody else who was an unbiased party, who was just asking a lot of questions and helping them navigate and hear. Like a lot of times I just say back to people what they've said. I know I'm not a therapist, but I'm also like listening. And they, when they hear what they have said, they go, oh, I said that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so, uh, so by the end of our conversation, they had made for themselves some decisions on how they wanted to change how they're living. And part of, I'll, I'll say this cause I know I can say this um, and it's okay. I have permission for this. It's not a confidential thing. Um, one of the things this person loved was stock car racing and they love it, but they never did it. And they started doing it again. Like they felt like that it was what was brought them life. And they raced for that whole next season and they won almost every race that they did. They, they fix up their car and everything. And their family saw this person, who's a man, saw him come alive in ways that they hadn't seen. He didn't change jobs. He's in the same job. Mm-hmm. But he's, he's the, the fulfillment that he has by doing the thing he loves that he felt too responsible and too risk averse. Like it was too much of a challenge for him to do that because he felt like, it would take away from his family, but yet it wasn't, he he wasn't getting the life that he needed from the way that he was wired, the way that God had made him. And that was something from his own childhood. It was one of his favorite moments with his dad was to do that because his dad was a stock car racer. It's so interesting because I have found that too, coaching people that the things that used to bring us joy as kids Um, We forget about them. And when we remind ourselves of that and we incorporate some of that playfulness back in life, it really can change your perspective. Like you said, this guy is still in, in the same job that he was in, but his bucket is being filled up by an activity that God uniquely wired him to feel joy in. And so it doesn't, going through this kind of coaching or this kind of discovery about how God made you doesn't have to result in some monumental shift in your life. It could, and I'm sure that it does, but sometimes we just need to be reminded that it's okay to be who we are, you know? Yeah, absolutely. I see that a lot with people. One of the main things that ends up happening, and people don't always expect this, but in these conversations, I'll just point out to people that sounds like a limiting belief to me. It sounds like when you say I have to do this or I need to do this or I can't do that, that that sounds like there's something else happening there. And so then we start talking about those things. And most of the time, I mean, every single client that I've had, and there's been a lot of them at this point, there there are these limitations that they've self-imposed from what they or someone around them has said to them at some point in their life that they just hold and then they lack the confidence 
to choose to move forward in a way that is freedom for them. Yeah. I'm thinking of just times in someone's life that it might be helpful to do something like what you do for people when you coach. And I'm thinking of like the traditional time seasons, which is like at the end of high school when you're trying to figure out what you want to do with your life, or if you have a transition in life, um, you know, a, a death of a loved one or a divorce or something that's causing you to rethink life in general. But are there other kind of um, particular circumstances or times of life that you've found it's been particularly helpful for people to do this kind of discovery work about themselves? Yeah, yes, you definitely named one major one or, or two really, but the like the transition to independence from being with within your family unit typically. Um, so from, from being like in high school into college or into the workforce and then mid career, a lot of times people are, are working through, they've either not done the thing they've always wanted to, and they feel a lot of regret or they've done all the things and they're like, what's next? Or they're somewhere in between where they're just, they're stuck. They, people get stuck or they have, I think that's a good point that experiencing loss, um, those are real, but a lot of times people have unrealized dreams. They just don't know how to access them because they've been sitting on the table for a long time and they feel a little bit dusty and maybe antiquated, different things happen. And then another time that people don't often think of, or maybe not readily think of, is as people near retirement, because they think, well, now what kind of value will my life bring if I'm not producing in this particular way? Yeah. What do I do? Do I just vacation forever? I mean, that's not, I, one of the people that I'm working with currently, they just want to retire and they're burnt out. That's what's going on for them is they're burnt out. And I'm like, yeah, but what do you want? If you want to retire, what do you want? Because there's a lot more underneath the surface with, um, with what people want. And even in the retirement phase, it's like, it's not just about sitting around in your chair all day or being able to, I don't know, cruise the world or something. But Although so that sounds lovely <laughs> it, to me. I mean, when, when working hard and a lot, it, it does sound lovely, it, but that usually speaks to the fact that you probably just want some more rest or some more leisure. Yeah. Right. And so it's like, Oh, well, I actually just need some life balance. But the, the, I mean, I think about that with retirement. So that's just a whole nother zone. Mm -hmm. um, so people kind of in all phases of life, I think mostly what it is, is that people, we just get busy and then we tend to forget about the thing that most aligns us with our purpose and, or how to stay aligned with our purpose because, um, because we're doing the stuff. And so yeah. without an anchor point or without anchor points and people, as I call like tent pigs, the people who surround me and hold me up and keep me standing in the way that is healthy and viable, um, that they speak truth back to me, or they help me to, to keep from being blown away by the wind to use, keep going with that metaphor. Um, I, I will tend to um, either collapse in on myself or drift away. <laughs> and so, um, and, and I feel like a credo statement, it does help to do that. It helps. It's an anchor point. Yeah. It's like, we get so busy just surviving that we forget we were made to thrive. Yeah, that's and right. So I think that it's just an important reminder. I love this conversation because it's just important to check in with yourself every so often and, and, yeah. and ask like, is this, the life that God created me for, because when, while we think that we don't have choices, sometimes we actually do have a lot of choices in, in, in how we live our lives. And, um, and like you said, the alignment with what we are made to be and made to do and how, and how we spend our time. So how do you, when let's say somebody wants to pursue this and learn more about themselves and develop their own credo. How long does that process usually take when they work with you? Well, that depends. So I have a class that you could take online and do it at your own pace. And then when I do it with people one-on-one, -on -one, 
then I usually, it's a, a minimum of four sessions for conversations. And so then I'll walk people through and I'll have them think through that vocational triangle and then we'll create a, a working credo. I'll have them test it out, sit with it for a bit and then, um, and then think about potential careers of somebody that I'm working with now that's in transition. So we've just finished this whole process and they're transitioning from one job. They don't know what their next job is going to be. And so then we were talking about all of this and, um, and we met and we met in four sessions and we're going to do a follow-up one in about a month after they finish this job, because now they feel way more hopeful, way less bitter. They were feeling a bit bitter and angsty because their job is ending um, and apathetic. And so now they're, they're in this space of like, Oh yeah, I can do this. And so they're looking forward to it. So usually it's about four sessions to begin with. It depends kind of on the, the level of change and transition. Sometimes when people are starting something new or are feeling really, really stuck, I, I tell them this, this is more than just getting you a credo statement. This is getting you out of your head and this is getting you into your body and, and getting a bit more strategic. And that, you know, I coach people for 12 weeks when it's something like that, or I'll coach people for six months and we'll just spread it out a little bit more. Sometimes it also depends on like, is this somebody that wants to meet every week that's able to do that? Or are they an executive who needs to meet, you know, biweekly or once a month kind of a thing. Can you give an example of a credo statement? Sure. I'll give you mine. Uh, so I would say that God put me on earth to nurture people to own and activate their calling so they can thrive in all they are and do. And so if you were to hear that statement kind of slowed down, I put God put me on earth. I feel like that's really important beginning to that statement for me because I believe that God is my originator. And then to nurture people, uh, I often will exchange that for coach. But when I think about all the mentoring, all the ways that I've been formed, supported, and I'm a mother of two, I think nurturing is actually my best mode. And mm. so I, I nurture people when I think about people. It is, um, there's often some particularities for me as to who those people are. A lot of times it's women because that's my embodied experience, but then it's also uh, women of color because they're the most marginalized. And I know that when we raise their boats, it helps support them to raise their boats. All boats get raised. And that's part of my dissertation work that I've done um, for, with my doctorate. And so just wanting to support them in particular, but I, but I say people because I coach a lot of men too, <laughs> I work with a lot of different people. And, and so, but then there's an ethos I'm working from on that. And then, um, to own and activate their calling. So this sense of purpose for them, so that way they can thrive. I think about that thrive versus survive. And actually when we were on one of those doctoral trips, Laura, uh, we went to the, I think it was the Museum of History, the Smithsonian in Washington, D.C. And I remember seeing the timeline of human history and it had the spectrum of like thriving, surviving, extinction. Mm. And so I'm like, let's go full opposite. <laughs> let's go all the way to the thriving. And I direct two thriving programs with Portland Seminary. And so there's a lot that that, hold, that holds a lot of weight for me, what it looks like for people to thrive. And holistically thrive. And then I always say, and all they are like who you are first, what you do second, I tend to be an achiever. So for me, that's anchoring for me. I want people to know that who they are matters before what they do. I need to own that. I get to support people and, and owning that as well. So there you go. There's the breakdown of my credo. I love it. I love it. So if, if somebody wants to develop their own credo or go through this process with you, how would they get in touch with you or learn more? Yeah. So the easiest way is to go to my website. Our website is leadershipcenter.co. So C-O at the end of that. And there's all the information. We're updating our website. We're doing some, some new changes to it to add a few new things with our team. And that would probably be the easiest way you can schedule a discovery conversation that way. You can find our um, learn it, like, what is it? Our life calling discovery class. So that's this class that talks about the credo. And, um, and it's, those are video, audio video classes with some work, workbook type things you can do with it. And then you can schedule coaching through that site too. So leadershipcenter.co is the best way to find out and learn more. 
Amazing. And I'll mention that I'm currently going through your course. So I'm excited to get my credo established and then I'll be able to share it here on the podcast as well. But I do think it's a useful, a useful tool and a useful experience um, for people to think about. And I just love that through discovering your calling, you are now helping other people discover theirs. It's just a beautiful way to see God at at work in the world. So thank you so much for sharing, for telling us about your story and how God has moved in your life. And to anybody listening, I would highly encourage you to reach out to Trisha if you're just finding yourself stuck in terms of the question, what do I want to do with my life or what is God calling me to in my life? Trisha is a great resource and um, we'll have her contact info linked in the show description below. And um, thanks again, Trisha for for sharing here on normal goes a long way thanks it's been really fun to just have this conversation